Welcome into another episode of Everything is Logistics, a podcast for the thinkers in freight. We are proudly presented by SPI Logistics, and I am your host, Blythe Brumleaf, and I am happy to welcome in for the second time ever to my podcast, Adam Wingfield. He is the founder of Innovative Logistics Group, and we're going to be talking all about the yellow situation, but also everything that he's got going on because he's been in this industry for a while. He's one of the smartest people that I follow on social media when it comes to anything like freight related. So I'm excited to dive into this conversation today. So Adam, welcome back. Thanks for having me again. Blythe, it's good to see you again. Absolutely. Now, now, for folks who may not be aware, we were just kind of joking <laughs> about this uh, before we started recording. But the first time I, I chatted with you, it was at the PCS Software Conference. And it That's was my right. first time doing mobile recording, like on-site recording. So I was dealing with cell phone issues, Wi-Fi issues, battery storage issues, but I basically had to position a cell phone on top of a Coke can in order to get it to record properly. And then we had about, I think 13 minutes was the exact time that I, I had to fill and you nailed it. It was one of the best conversations I have honestly ever had. And you covered so much ground in that 13 minutes. So I'm happy to have you back in a little bit more of a, a you know, a, a conversation where we can, you know, talk a little bit longer than 13 minutes. <laughs> Glad to be back. Glad to be back. That was an incredible showing of just versatility and just making things happen. And, and this is a legitimate true story. So um, you had to be there. You had to be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was also the first conference, I think, back for a lot of us because of yeah. COVID and all. Yeah, um, it so it was just one of those, like, we're just going to figure it out. And and I it think was. that that's kind of the, the story of, of freight, the story of logistics and the story of, you know, hopefully you figure it out, but sometimes you don't. And uh, before we get into the, the yellow situation, give folks a little bit of an understanding of, of your career background. So I started off as a driver. You know, I started off as a company driver. As soon as I was uh, old enough to get my CDL, I went to Schneider and I went to their training school and I got my CDL license to drive a tractor trailer. I was always intrigued by it. I always loved it. I was, you know, it's kind of was like one of those things that was my long going passion was to always be in, in the industry. And um, a couple of years later, I, you know, purchased my first truck, became my owner operator. And then I really you know, that's when the light bulb came on and the eyes opened up a lot wider that, you know, the industry has a lot of components in it. And, you know, a young kid, you know, behind the wheel of a truck and, uh, you know, just kind of getting out there and understanding that I didn't realize how much business was involved to it at that time. Um, so that really, really kind of fueled my fire to, to make sure that I, I get out there and, and, and help folks to understand it and help folks navigate through it. So that was kind of just the foundational start and principle behind it. Then as years go by and my fleet grew and I start learning more and more about the business and I start seeing other people's fail, uh, it really was a pain point for me, you know, because of my passion is to make sure that people are successful, especially in trucking, because I love it so much. And, um, you know, what I wanted to do is put a compelling program together, put a compelling team together. I was just really focused on helping folks navigate the right way through it with all of the the stuff that's going on and all of the directions that are out there. So that kind of gives them a little background of, uh, of me and just a really, really small nutshell. And so what was the, I guess, the moment that you decided that you were going to, because you're not a driver anymore, correct? You're, you're just yeah. you're solely yeah. a, you know, a business owner and educating others within the industry, right? Yeah, I retired. I retired from behind the wheel a long time ago, but I did put a million miles on the highway. So I, you know, I, that was a, that was a lot of experience, a lot of blue collar experience. And I always told myself, I wanted to learn from the inside out. I wanted to start a trucking company from the inside out. I didn't want to get into it without knowing the intricacies and I didn't want to get into it without, um, you know, navigating through the adapt the, the adaptions that needed to happen. But, but, but when I came outside of the truck and I really started seeing it more of an executive level and supporting executive level companies, I saw how much opportunity that I left out on the table, even within my own fleet. And I'm able to take those things now and install them into companies as well. And what, what were some of those things that you noticed that you didn't realize as a driver? Man, just just the, the the power of networking and relationships that was just so impactful because even as a driver, you know, it's kind of like I I, I kind of like make it as a parallel to a corn maze. Like if you've ever done Halloween, you know, you get into a corn, you know, a little corn maze where you got to navigate through and get to the end of it. But you know, as a driver, you're in that corn maze. You're just trying to figure it out. You know, you're going by the ebbs and the flows of the road, and when you do have that much time to really think, you know, you really don't see it from a big picture. However, if I'm in a deer stand. 
and I'm trying to help you navigate through a corn maze, I can say, hey, Blythe, no, don't turn left here. Turn right. Now keep going straight. Take two more steps. Go right. And that's where I started seeing things more of an enterprise level. And seeing it as, a, as an enterprise level, I'm wanting to help people see things at a higher level, too. I want to see people help think people to see through from a scalability perspective. So just looking at it from a big picture, establishing better relationships, going out to different events, even though it might not be trucking related events, those business networking events. I started to notice how that was a big connector for me, because you may be introducing yourself to someone who, you know, for instance, I, I met a local city councilman one time. And we was just out in a networking event and he was just talking about this huge billion dollar project that they were working on in the city and they needed logistics support. And they were looking for a consultancy or services or logistics companies that can help support that. Well, I wouldn't have known that if I was just sitting in a truck stop and just kind of chatting back and forth about, you know, this broker doing this or this person doing that. So it opened up my eyes, most importantly, in the power of people, the power of networking with people. That was the number one thing that I identified. And then obviously the whole tech side, really getting involved with tech on, on, on that side and showing how important that is to separate yourself from other carriers because it's such a competitive landscape. And when you're able to identify those niches that you can specialize in and the differentiators that you can provide, it makes you a step ahead of the rest. And I didn't, I didn't see that. I'm just going to be honest. I didn't see that until I really stepped out and looked at it from a higher lens. And then there was no one that was talking about it at that time. There was no direction then. I mean, to be honest with you, we didn't have GPSs, right? We had Randy McNally atlases, so we didn't have, I mean, you got to think about that time. But now that we are in the area of technology and technology is becoming so much of a part of what we do, using the power of that technology and leveraging it in our own businesses is something that I'm really, 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 really hell bent on that right now. What about the drivers, I guess, that say that it's, it's too much technology? You're taking away the skill set of the, the driver when they have to pay attention to all of these different tools that some drivers are very good that they don't necessarily, they feel like they don't necessarily need those tools. What is sort of the balance, I guess, between using the tools and ultimately just always relying on them? There's a there's always over leverage, you know, and, and there's over leverage in everything. You know, there's over leverage of technology, there's over leverage in financing, and just like you said, there's some that, you know, that can get out there and they can manage and adapt. But when you have, for instance, when you have insurance companies, and I've seen several insurance companies that require technology in the cab, they require in facing cabs, they require safety monitoring. So they were requiring on those things to help lower their risk. You know, it's all about really kind of kind of communicating the why. And really, when it comes down to technology and the speed of technology, the most important thing that we're doing is we're really trying to just help people understand the speed that it's coming and explaining the why behind it and really trying to get them to get that buy in. But they're, they're, you, you, we run into it all the time. You know, you got, you know, you, there was a mega carry that made an announcement last week that they were installing, you know, dash cams as a primary uh, focus in their fleet. And they were moving 30, 40, 50 percent of their fleet is going to be all in face and dash cams by the end of the year. So it's moving very quickly. And they're doing that because of the risks that are associated and involved with it. And they're trying to just get this thing more in line with being a really true federally mandated industry. And safety is really, really important. Yeah, it's almost like one of those things where I, I think for a lot of folks, they're fearing the anxiety of like tech and robots and AI, yeah. like all taking yeah. over. And I think it all plays into like that sort of larger fear set when when you break it down a little bit more. It's like, well, you know, especially when it comes to like marketing and sales and like, you know, yeah. chat GPT, things like that. When I, I definitely want to ask you about that later on. But it's one of those things where it's like, uh you can either use the tools and use them to your advantage or, you know, it, it's it, the the cat is out of the bag. Like it's it's not you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's uh, one of those things where you have to you have to adapt to these certain situations um, and these certain requirements and these, uh, I guess, evolutions uh, of technology and where innovation is, is headed. And I think, you know, with that being said, it's, uh, you know, going into one of the bigger companies, the largest trucking company that has, you know, ever gone bankrupt. That was yellow. Um, they officially mm -hmm. filed for bankruptcy this week. Um, it's kind of been in the works for, you know, a few weeks now, maybe months for folks who may not be aware of the entire yellow situation. How did we get here? 
You know, I think that really kind of boils back. It starts over. You want to go back to deregulation in the 80s. And, you know, Yellow was around for a very, very long time. I think they were about to hit 100 years this year. Mm-hmm. 99 years. So when you go back to de- deregulation, that causes a lot of increased competition that Yellow may not have seen before. And, you know, as they kind of adapted to that and they adapted to their overall competition, um, that became a major part of it. And then when you dropped in COVID, and you dropped in the relief that they received from COVID, that $700 million relief that they received from COVID, um, and the inability to really kind of go back. And, and num- number one, when you have the uh, the government saying, hey, oops, you know, we weren't supposed to give you guys that money, which could tell you that they may not were necessarily qualified for a variety of reasons. Um, and now you become over leveraged in financial ability. Now you over leverage your available capital. And that was one. And then you also got to look at it, too. Labor issues are always are going to be a major component of, of, of the industry. You know, whether any blue collar industry is going to have labor issues. But when you have a company that is managing their labor through a union, it becomes it becomes much more complex. And in some cases, it becomes much more convoluted. So now you've got a third party that's saying, hey, listen, you know, we want this now. And instead of having those independent relationships, that internal human resource process, uh, that kind of leaves it into a third party's hand. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say I'm for or against unions, but you have to understand what happens when you bring a workers union into an organization. You got to look at the pros and the cons and the things that can happen out of it. So you, you, you add that onto that and then you look at their overall debt load, right? So you got to think about all of the acquisitions that they took over the last several years. They acquired a lot of companies and they acquired some, some big companies over the, the, you know, over that period. And when you acquire companies and you're not leveraging that, you're not able to do that. I think all of that kind of came down into a, I hate to say a perfect storm, but man, we were some, somewhat, some north of 30,000 people that were affected and we're talking about 14,000 tractors and 40,000 trailers and 22,000 drivers. And these are just, you know, obviously these are, you know, not, not official numbers, but from what I've, what I've seen, uh, it's impacted a lot of people. And I think that when you had all of these things working, uh, and then on top of the lower demand that we're seeing, and, you know, and now you've got customers that when I talked about the competition poor part, when you hear customers saying something about bankruptcy, you know, now you got customers say, hey, I might want to move my freight somewhere else. And, you know, even though they were given a 30 day extension on 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 a default, uh, when you have that and you have your customers running, you know, from that perspective, I think that, that that's usually a recipe, but no, there's no way to come back from that. And I think that that's how they got to that point. Was it was it really just the customers that was the final like nail in the coffin for them that leaving? I mean, if you look at it from that perspective, they lost an incredible amount of freight. You know, the, when they when they made the announcements, when the you know when the Teamsters were saying, "Hey, this is what's going to happen if we don't tighten up," and now your customers like, "Whoa, whoa you know," when that happened, um, part of Yellow, one of Yellow's statements that they released to the public was a catastrophic loss in customers. Hmm. And when you think about that word catastrophic, you know, when you think about demand and volumes, uh, especially in this particular, the angst, in order for me to pay back a loan, I have to have receivables to do so. And if my customers are leaving and I, you know, I'm talking about catastrophic and you use the word catastrophic um, to describe any type of circumstance, we're talking about a major, major dominating effect. And when you don't have those customers in place to be able to go back and make a uh, you know, make a repayment on something like that. You can see where that would cause that to 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 almost be a paid place of no return. So at that point, the, the executive team made the decision and say, you know what, there's no way we're going to be able to come back from this. You know, here's the best thing that we can do at this point. And I think that that's where we got to. Why do you think that they played this? I mean, I, I guess it, it just felt like such a public battle. It was like almost looking at like your parents getting divorced and yeah. you have like a front row seat of every personal detail. That's go- Why did it play out so publicly? Man, you know, I'll tell you, Blythe, and I'll be honest with you, social media is a gift and a curse. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some people over leverage their power on social media. At the the back and forth, and when you look at some of the posts and some of the rhetoric that was taking place, it was some really really aggressive rhetoric. And I and I understand that part of it was perhaps for them to be able to go in and get a little bit more leverage. 
but it was it was it was, it, it, it was quite a battle and it was quite a very very public situation and i hate that sometimes social media provides a platform in that in that realm to where it's kind of like gloves off and people forget about handling things like that amicably behind closed doors and it just got messy it really did and that's uh, so I, I worked at an asset base, um, 3PL, uh, you know, about 12 years ago, and it went out of business after five years. And a very similar, you know, uh, not very similar, but a lot of the, the situations that happened publicly, it very much reminded me of what was going on back then, where you executives were having a lot of closed door meetings, you know, it, an entire intermodal department got laid off, we had outside financing that came in to try to save the company, there were a lot of moments that it felt like a disaster, but there were also like moments of hope, moments of, okay, this company can actually be saved. My, you know, I, I don't have to switch jobs. I don't have to worry about finding a new job. And it felt like it was a lot of that was happening here with the yellow situation where the, the final couple weeks, you know, I've, I've seen a couple posts from, a, you know, a few executives that, that are, you know, essentially trying to hire, you know, some of the top talent that, that worked at yellow. And they said, you know, basically the last couple of weeks, it was a lot of confusion and a lot of hope. And it felt very similar to, to, to my situation, except for social media was very much in its infancy. This was like, you know, very, very early on. So we didn't have mm -hmm. a lot of that playing out in public and i wonder if yellow maybe could have been saved if it wasn't for social media and a lot of you know a, a lot of people acting as sources a lot of people acting as reporters uh, it, it, do you get a, a sense of that feeling or do you think that this was just eventually going to happen so it just kind of reminds me of being on an airplane you know a pilot is going to go through you know in a, through the the worst turbulence and he knows it's going to happen but he's not going to say all right everybody it's time for you to get scared all right everybody it's going to be a terrible ride and, oh you might feel a few bumps here and there uh you know it's going to be a, a little choppy so they try to what they do is they try to lower that angst and i you know to, to be honest with you i don't think that social media was necessary kind of like the you know kind of like the nail in a coffin but I do feel like the rhetoric and I do feel like, like you said, you got so many people reporting and you got so many people put pressure. You got so many people posting drivers upset. And then you, it, it does it does weigh in. It does weigh in because of the reach that social media has put out there. But I think the demise of, of, of Yellow, whether public or private, um, was was inevitable just because of some of the decisions that were made at the executive level and the executive level uh, decisions that were made, they're people too, you know, at the end of the day. And I, and I, and I know that, and I feel, you know, I feel, I feel, I feel very, very, you know, it's, uh, sorry that they had to make those decisions because now you're talking about, you know, affecting in so many people and it was so many hardworking people that got affected. We talking about pensions that were lost. You know, I looked at the severance package and I was like, wow, you know, you're working in 27 years and you only get a two week paid, uh, a severance package. It was just, it was just a nightmare for folks. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't feel like social media was the the nail in the coffin. But it it, it certainly wasn't. Uh, it certainly wasn't helpful. Yeah, I, I I like that you brought that up because that was exactly what happened. And in my situation, where we, it, but it wasn't social media related. It was one person from another company telling me. Hey, I, you know, we're, we're hearing that you're running out of runway and you need to start looking for another job. And I told my brother who also worked at the company. And then, you know, of course, like that starts going around to, to everyone and it creates a, a, a form of panic and fear. My boss had to pull me aside and tell me, you can't tell people stuff like this because it's going to incite fear among the employees. And, you know, eventually it was the nail in the coffin for, for that situation where the executives, the executive leadership team choosing to leave and to go somewhere else. And that was that, that was sort of the, the end of the, the line for us. And it just felt so very similar. And I could not imagine being mm. one of those employees and seeing the different social media messages, seeing my job, my career, my livelihood being turned into to memes, which, you know, that's another mm. social media aspect of it too, where it's like, oh God, that would just kill me if I was in their position and I would mm. see people making, I mean, it is the internet. So, you know, to, to each their own, but that was one thing that I was very consciously like, I'm, I'm not going to make fun of this situation because the people mostly affected are the ones that have nothing to do with the decisions Absolutely. that were being made. Absolutely. Absolutely.
And so I, I saw a tweet that you you said recently, and it said, to this day, the most disturbing thing that I come across in the industry is the amount of company owners, large and small, that don't have an idea on the cost of operating a truck. The single truck owners concern me the most because everything is on the line with one truck. Now, because of that that statement, what and because of yellow, what can other, you know, sort of smaller carriers, even owner operators, what can they learn from the situation? You know, I think that the yellow freight situation has opened a lot of people's eyes up to the, you know, to the overall, hey, you know what? Nobody is exempt from the cause and effect of poor just oversight within the market and particularly with your own company. And I, I, you know, that that tweet is really it's it's alive and well in conversations that have been taking place with 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 clients and other folks for 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 decades now. And one of the things that 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 disturbed me the most, and I even had a conversation with a recent um, a recent person who was saying, you know, I was just making sure that every load that I got was paying at least 202 a mile. But then we go into the break even analysis and take a look at exactly what it costs to operate all of the equipment. And their break even analysis had them come in at 227. Hmm. So if you're running in at 227 in order for your truck to make money and in your mind, you're thinking that you're doing well at two bucks, then that's a huge problem. And what's going to eventually happen is you're going to do those things like I talked about earlier. You're going to over leverage capital, right? Over leverage available capital because you're trying to have that capital continue to fund your business with the hope that rates turn around and not really understanding, hey, you know what? This whole time I was running my trucking company at this operational point when it actually cost me to operate this company. My whole strategy was wrong. My whole focus and approach was wrong. And those are the decisions that can ultimately put you out of business very, very quickly. So I think that for me, why it's so it's it's so important that education and it's so important that our narrative is just really teaching people how to run a business. Hmm. And when I and, and I say that with the utmost respect to anyone, but just because I can, you know, cook a cheeseburger or I can, you know, I can, you know, make a pizza doesn't mean that I can start up a successful franchise or a successful restaurant. The business components have to be the overarching theme. And then everything else is just kind of the layer on the cake. And what we have to do is we have to get into the economical side from that perspective. We've got to look at the professional side and we got to get better at business acumen. And that tweet was really focused on really just opening up the awareness that the overarching acumen for business as from that perspective and the financial acumen that's required to run a trucking company is oversight to so many people. Because, again, like you said, what they do, a lot of education is I'm going to get on Facebook and I'm going to join a Facebook group and I'm going to say, hey, what do you guys think about this load here? And then you're going to have 100 people comment on it and say, hey, no, don't take that. You need to take it for $7 a mile or sit the truck down and shut it down. You got people getting information from so many di- different directions that they really don't know where to go. And unfortunately, I see that all the time. Me and my team, we see those things happen. I'm talking about hundreds of times a day where people are misguided and you got to look at the statistics at the end of the day. 80% of trucking companies that start within two years fail. 80%, eight out of 10. We have 51,000 trucking companies go out of business this year, Mm -hmm. right? So you're talking about that. These folks are not just going out of business because of you know, this is the market. The market is part of it, right? Your overall spot market is part of it. But people are going out of business because they didn't know what to expect coming into. They weren't prepared for the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows. So that tweet was really, 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 really guided and directed to get people to wake up and to start focusing on their business. Because without the business, none of this other stuff would take place. And I'm glad that you brought that up because during COVID and during, you know, sort of the the 2020, 2021, we saw so much freight hitting the market, but we also saw a lot of, you know, sort of fly by night trucking experts Mm -hmm. selling courses and creating, you know, informational products in order to sell people to get into the game and uh, Mm -hmm. almost like a 
pyramid scheme for, for a lot of these folks. What were the lessons uh, that, or what are the lessons that, that you teach to sort of counteract that quick, easy money? What are, what are some of those line items, those break even points that most people are missing from their business that they're not calculating for? So one of the things as a strategy, one of the things that we teach on any break even is that every mile matters, right? Every mile matters. So when I say every mile matters, every mile that that truck rotates, every time that that tire makes one complete turn, it has to pay everything from an amortization standpoint. What I mean by that is that everything that you have, every expense that's associated with that truck, regardless of what that load pays, regardless of you moving in deadhead, every time the tire rotates, your costs are being paid for. Right. So when I say that, I'm saying over that 12 months, you have everything from your fixed expenses, which is your truck payment, you know, trailer payment, insurance. Those are your fixed. But then it's also paying for all your variable expenses. It's paying for things that people don't consider, like your factoring fees. Right. Typically on a year on one truck, your factoring fees on average is about seven thousand dollars. But yet when an owner operator goes in and he's looking at that P&L and looking at a cost assessment, when you're looking at a load in this overall totality, usually what an owner operating a small fleet owner considers is fuel, driver pay, and maybe a couple other accessorials, and that's it. And they say, okay, here's the net. And I'm going to tell you, one of the things that aggravated me the most is when I saw these fly-by-night course creators and gurus on the internet and on social media during the pandemic, you would see them posting rate cons. And they would post a rate con from a C.H. Robinson or a TQL. And the Raycon would be like twenty six hundred bucks and they would put twenty six hundred dollars minus fuel, minus drive pay, driver pay, total profit. And that is absolutely the wrong answer. There is so much more that is associated with an income item because with every income item, you have to associate the expense items with it as well. Net profit is net profit. It's at the bottom of the barrel. It's the last thing you as an owner, you as a business owner, you as an owner operator, you get paid last after everything is considered. So when we talk about a break even analysis and we talk about the importance of understanding what that looks like, everything has to be in consideration prior to you saying, okay, you know what? Here's my profit. So our message has always been, you know, the tire turns. Every the, the tire turns is what causes the business to turn. And the thing that we really, really saw during the pandemic is we saw people take advantage of the market from from that perspective. We saw people getting in to, to the business brand new, fresh. We saw people that were experts that just got in a truck in after a year. Right. And one season doesn't make you an expert. One good season doesn't make you a good expert. And then one bad season doesn't make you a failure. And what we're wanting to make people understand is that you have to see the full scope. You've got to have some experience into it. And there's a difference when you speak from experience versus speaking from opinion. Facts. I, yeah, very, very well said. And, and I'm, I'm sure for a lot of these folks, you know, for a lot of these business owners, they're they're trying to find where those opportunities are to, to not only break even, but make a little bit extra during these hard times. Are there any sort of, you know, low hanging fruit opportunities that they could be looking for in their own financial statements? Is it or is it just a, as simple and as hard as just figuring out that break even point? I think one of the things is, and I and I don't, and when when we talk about the break even point, we're not we're not wanting to get that misconstrued. We're telling people they need to operate at the break even point. What we're doing is we're telling people to understand exactly what that is, and then you focus on the next item that we preach, which is your operational run rate. That operational run rate is like, say, if I say, hey, Blythe, you know, just from a forecasting or just from a long term perspective, what are your goals? Well, you know what, my profit goals are twenty percent, right? So if your profit goals are 20 percent and your break even point is two dollars, then you know that your operational run rate would have to be 20 percent of two dollars. So that would be 240. So now Blythe knows that at the end of the day, every opportunity I have to secure freight at 240 or above will keep me on track with my goals and my visions for my company, for my independent, you know, my independent company, for my fleet, whatever that may look like. So we want to really teach the importance of the break even. The break even is your your base. It's your floor. It's your foundation. You know, your break even is how you build your house. Your operational run rate is your your fixtures, your you know your dishes, your you know all that other great stuff that you put on the, on the top of it. I want people to understand and respect both. I want people to understand the importance of understanding why the break even point matters, but also from a business owner and you're a business owner as well. 
you understand like, hey, we can't plan for tomorrow or, or, or Friday. We're planning for, okay, all right, now we're in Q1 of 2024. What are our goals for Q1 of 2024? What are our goals for Q2? What are we looking at? What, what customer relationships are we setting ourselves up for? And I want small carriers to have a big carrier mindset when they're doing these things, when they're going out and they're building these relationships and they're focusing on that financial literacy and acumen within their business. So that's the reason why we're so, so strong on the break even point, because it's getting them to see where their foundation is. It's getting them to understand that their foundations change. But most importantly, it's giving them that floor that they can build their goals off of. And it's giving them that floor that they can establish their projection. Now, if I know where my break even point is, now I know I can say, okay, cool. All right, you know what? I want to make a 15% profit in Q1. This is how we're going to do it. Okay, 15% profit in Q1. Now I've got to book at 230 a mile. I got to make sure that at the end of every week, I'm going to win some, I'm going to lose some, but at the average, I need to be at 230. And if I'm not at 230, then next week, that means I've got to book more. I got to book a higher rate so I can help bring myself up to that average. So it's all about teaching them that part. And I, I think that that's the most important thing is teaching them the business side of it. And then also, you know, to, 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 to be quite frank, it's teaching them to get off of spot market reliance mm-hmm. and starting to focus on building their own direct, their own customers, their own uh, freight examples to where they don't have to focus so much on the ebbing and flows of the spot market. And so what, what I guess is, is uh, maybe some of the, the lessons learned, not just from yellow, but from everything that you just mentioned, the market is what it is. You know, there, there's, you know, predictions that it's going to be better in the Q4, that it's going to be better, especially in, in, in 2024. So are businesses going to be able to survive this, you know, sort of, I guess, economic turmoil until those things pick up? Or is it still very, very plausible that you can survive as a small carrier if you're doing everything that you, you said, you know, you have your operational costs and then you have your profit margins that, that you want to go after. Are, are those things realistic in a market? like this they're realistic they're not easy Mm. they're realistic but they're not easy um because you know we're we're at the mercy in a spot condition you're at the mercy of whatever happens so when yellow went out right so what that is going to do obviously it's going to increase demand on the ltl side which is going to increase demand on truckload side just be obviously it's a cause and effect and that was something that nobody predicted so the spot market is so unpredictable and when I when I think about that and I think about, you know, the small carrier and the plausibility of being able to survive these marketplaces, you can as long as you know where your floor is, as long as you know how to be able to control your variable costs, because the only thing that you can control are your variable expenses. Somewhat you're fixed. You can control that somewhat. But once you purchase that truck, your truck payment is what it is. Your trailer payment is what it is. Your insurance is already is what it is. But being able to know how to lower your variable expense footprint because that's what you can control. I can't control the spot market. You know, I can control it. There's nobody that has a crystal ball. that can say, okay, guys, January 17th, it's on, it's, it's carry go season. Nobody's going to be able to tell you that because nobody knows when a yellow freight is going to file for bankruptcy, when a Celadon is going to file for bankruptcy, when COVID becomes a pandemic, nobody knows that stuff. So you got to focus on the preparation and you got to focus on making sure that you demand control over your own business and become, I tell you, and I, and I, and I say this all the time, if you're going to be the CEO of your company, you need to act like it and you need to act like it with integrity. You need to act like it with an intention because there's things that you're going to be able to control within anything, but those things that you can't control, you got to be able to focus your attention on the things that you can and I think that plausibility is, 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 is yes, it's absolutely a, a, there. We still have small carriers out there that's fighting and scrapping and still staying in the game. How long they're going to be able to do that, all deter- it, it all depends. We don't know what's happening out in, you know, in, in Ukraine and what that's going to do with fuel prices. We don't know if we're going to see a spike like we saw in November and December last year when diesel prices went through the roof. We don't know that. So the small carriers that are really trying to stay into it, We got to make sure that we stay in tune with every single line item, every single day, every mile per hour, every mile per gallon matters. And we've got to teach these small carriers out here to focus on that versus on, oh, my God, the brokers out here to screw us or, oh, my God, the government's out here to take us all out of business. Listen, 
We can say that all day long. You know, we can get back and forth with the opinions on that all day long. But the fact of the matter is you need to know your business and you need to run it like you're the CEO of the company. And you, you had mentioned just uh, just now about, you know, uh, these carriers getting off of the load boards, getting off of the spot yeah. market. Where are you seeing some, I guess, moments of success for, for, for businesses who are doing that? Who, how do you reach out to a customer? How do you develop a relationship with, uh, you know, a broker rep? What, are the, what do those steps look like? Yeah, I love it because, you know, here's, first of all, you got to remember your brokers are your customers. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's one of the things that I see a lot of small carriers don't approach the conversation like that, right? If Blythe's the broker and Blythe's providing me freight and I'm moving freight for her, Blythe is my customer. Mm -hmm. I have to nurture that relationship, whether or not, and regardless of all the noise out here is, oh yeah, Blythe's the broker, the broker's out here to screw the small carriers. Well, in this instance, Blythe is my customer and I've got to provide Blythe with exceptional customer service. I got to make sure I pick up on time. I got to make sure I deliver on time. I got to make sure I over communicate and I got to make sure to ask for feedback. Right. So I got to ask her, how, how did I do? What can I do to get better? What can I do to make sure that I'm positioning and I'm at the top of your mind mm -hmm. to be the one that if you came across a really, really good, good lane, I would be the first person that you call because I'm going to tell you this spot market freight is a broker's last option, period. That's the last shot. That's the bottom of the barrel. It's the, the dirtiest of the apples. It's just it's putting it on the low board and hoping a carrier with integrity takes it off the low board and gets it from point A to point B. That's the fact of it, right? And here's the thing. A broker is a third-party intermediary. Shippers rather work with brokers, especially because they have the fingertips on all the capacity. That's the way it is, right? So instead of getting caught up in the whole, uh, whether it's propaganda or whatever we want to think about it, like, why not just nurture a relationship? Blythe's a broker, but guess what? Blythe is still a person, mm -hmm. and she's a cool person. I like talking to Blythe. Let's, you know, that those are the things that that we have to get get through to our, to, to to folks' head. That's number one. Number two is, and from a success standpoint, I did a, an Instagram live, you know, about a month ago, and I got on a live, and I was just talking about things like making sure that you you're, you're treating your brokers like customers, getting on there and focus on digital freight matching services like Emerge Technologies, getting out there and making sure that you're doing things such as going to networking events that might not be trucking related, right? And I'm not talking about going out to these conferences. I'm talking about the networking events that in your area, in your cities, in your towns, where you can go out and if anybody is in this zip code, they know exactly what Adam does. And what you see and you realize a lot of times, and I talked about this on stage about a year ago, is that you see folks that run trucking companies in these towns and these cities, but have no idea who the shippers and manufacturers and distributors, they have no idea, no clue who these people are, hmm. right? And you think about that, like, how can, you know, if, you know, if you, you come to Charlotte, you can't come to Charlotte and people don't know what I do because I'm getting out there. I'm going to networking events. And even before, and one of the things, even when I started, you know, really getting on the educational side of trucking, I was at every single networking event and I was the only person in trucking at these networking events. It was small business networking events and I'm talking to people, letting them know exactly what I'm doing. So just two things I'm doing, I'm bringing about awareness. So they're like, well, oh, well, I didn't realize that, that that's an option. And number two, I'm making connections because now these folks, when they have these conversations, these large scale environments, they're like, wait a minute. I talked to this guy the other day. I have his card and that's exactly what he does. Let me connect you with this person. So really focusing on connections, but you know, one of the things, Blythe, that I, I, I see people struggle with is they struggle with, with basic communication. Hmm. I hate to say that. Um, it reminds me of my, my, my children. I love them to death. But when these cell phones and tablets and all these things became part of our norm, the new norm is not, you know, hey, hey Blythe, how you doing? Let's meet for coffee and let's have a conversation. The norm now is just being on Twitter and seeing what everybody else is saying or being on threads or whatever they call it or being on Facebook and really not being able to go out and communicate. So I see a lot of people who feel entitled because I've got a truck and a trailer with 53 feet of space. I'm entitled and you should give me your dedicated freight. Well, I'm sorry, buddy. That's not how it works. You and a million other trucks out there, I have the option. You tell me why I need to choose you versus anybody else. The way that happens is I first I've got a nurtured relationship. It would be like if I would send you mentioned email marketing and how chat GBT has helped email marketing. Could you imagine if I just just in one email just say, hey, buy this for me. Oh, you know, you need to buy it right now. That's not how it works. It, sometimes it's a four. You in sales, sometimes four, sometimes five points, sometimes six, sometimes, sometimes seven different contact points that you're making and nurture that relationship. And I'll never forget 
you know, this is a, this is a story that I will never forget. I was, I was coaching a customer and she had nine trucks and she was in the Dallas area and she was, you know, and, and, and she was on the spot market and we were trying to get her off the spot market. And one day I was just watching her. We were just talking on the zoom and she was in her kitchen and in the back of the kitchen, she had, I was just like, hold on for a second. I, I've got to pull this out of the oven. And so she goes to the oven and she pulls some cookies out of the oven. I'm joking. I was like, man, I can smell those cookies all the way over here. I was like, you should leverage that. So you know what she did? She went to the Pepsi place and it was like a, a Pepsi shipper that was in her area. And she started connecting and networking with the, the folks over at, at, at the Pepsi facility. Well, fast forward the story. So one Friday, she baked cookies and sent them over to the office. Guess what? That Monday she was meeting and she cleared her dedicated lane through Pepsi because she just just became a human for a second. You're a human at first. Right. Act like it. You know what I'm saying? Act like act like this is not new to you to be able to communicate. And, you know, the crazy thing is, is that at the end of the day, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Right. But how do you get to who you know? How do I know? How did I know Blight? Well, I got to open my mouth and talk. Hey, how are you doing? What do you do? Hey, this is what I do. That element is missing. It's missing because I feel that the internet has put a lot of pressure on people. And I also feel that people just forgot their, you know, they, it's almost like that whole social social distancing that we've experienced over that year. COVID became a, an ideology that we're now social distancing ourselves from each other. And it's really getting in between us. It's getting in between our ability to be able to work together. And that's kind of how I feel about that situation. I, I noticed when you were listing off the things that, you know, the, these carriers should be doing that you didn't really mention email marketing. You didn't really mention social media. Uh, you mentioned going out and networking, baking cookies, doing something nice and sending that over to a company. Those are the things that are going to make you stand out because everybody is can email market, e- email, e- e- email and social media. Anybody can do that. But those little things that you're talking about, they take a, a time investment, but they also take you know, I guess a, a, a personality investment is maybe the phrase I'm, I'm looking to use because you're right. When you go to some of these networking events and you're not a social person, it can feel a little awkward. But the only way you're going to get better at it is if you keep going and you keep practicing and you keep polishing up those social media skills and, and not in a digital sense, but in the personal in-person sense. You know, you mentioned something about polishing. And one of the other things that people are not doing these days, they're not developing themselves, Mm -hmm. right? So a lot of times what they want to do is they'll buy a truck, buy a trailer, and they're focusing on, okay, hey, you know, how do I go get on this low board? I'm going to do whatever. But they don't start developing those things within themselves that they're not good at, right? If you're not good at networking or you're not, like CEOs have to talk. You have to talk, regardless if you're a CEO of of one truck and one driver or a CEO of 30,000. You have to have that leadership development. You have to constantly develop yourself as a person. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that all I'm going to do is look at YouTube videos of motivational speeches. That means sometimes I might have to do things such as I might have to buy a book or I might have to enroll in a college course on communication or I might need to do, you know, join a a local thing that will help me speak like Toastmasters or whatever that may be. You have to continuously develop yourself. And as a small carrier, I don't care if you're the CEO of one truck or the CEO of 50,000, I'm going to come at you with the same exact message. And that message is, is that without that self-development and without professional development and progression, there's going to always be a byproduct of regression. And that regression could eventually cause the demise of your company. And that demise of your company can be the demise of your vision. And I don't want that to happen, but we have got to take the entitlement glasses off. We got to take the, the the entitlement feeling that, hey, just because I have this and just because everybody is saying that, like, I'm different. And you have to operate with that level of intention, integrity, and just focus. Yeah, because no one else is going to come do it for you. Nobody's going to save you. Exactly. And I, if you haven't learned that lesson over the last few years, I, you know, you, you better learn it quick. Um, so for, if you were to get your CDL today, what would you do differently, if anything, versus when you first got it? If I was going to get my CDL today, what would I doubt is, man, that's a great question. Well, I think for me, I think the, that for me, knowing what I know now, the only thing differently that I would possibly have done that I, that, I, that I didn't do the first time 
is really, really just appreciate those those moments that I was out there and appreciate them for the lessons that I learned. You know, there's a lot of I had a lot of mistakes, um, you know, a lot of heartaches and, and some things that you try to put on the, you know, the back mirror. But you got to understand it's not perfect. And I think that I still hold my CDL to this day. It's probably, you know, one of my most prized possessions because, you know, I look at that license every single day and I look at, you know, the things that I got as a as 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 a result of it you know and i don't you know i don't directly attribute my success solely to my cdl um but my cdl opened up a door for me and once i got into that door i was able to to grow and expand in a lot of different thoughts um i just one of the narratives that you see now also on social media is like hey everybody go get your cdl and make a lot of money well i'm just going to tell you that's just not how it works you know it's it's hard work it's sacrifice um you know it, it takes a mental toll on you Um, But once you open the door, there's a lot of other rooms that you can go in once you get in the front door and you don't have to just stand in the foyer like everybody else. I'm the one that didn't stand in the foyer. I got in there. I stood in the foyer. I was like, "Ah, hey. But then I went to the other room and I'm like, you know what? I like this room better. Um, And that would really, you know, that's really kind of accelerating me. But, but, you know, that go back on the question. I just felt like, you know, my decision um, when I got my CDL was 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 partially obviously because I always had the desire and commitment to want to be involved in the industry. Um, it was also a, a moment for me because I lost both of my parents and I was struggling with depression and and it was also a moment for me um, to help focus on my mental health and and I and I tell people you know all the time you know having my CDL saved my life you know especially when you, when you think about the you know just the thoughts that I had and the dark thoughts that I had and 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 things like that it really really saved my life it really allowed me to see the world for for what I what I saw it allowed me to really grow up you know it helped me grow up become a man become a decision maker it helped me make uh believe in myself you know and believe in the ability to accomplish things and and I just to this day man I you know I think that for me personally it's it was you know having my CDL changed my life you know it allowed me to you know live the life that i'm able to live and 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 i I just i just i couldn't you know i couldn't imagine my life without it i just couldn't imagine my life without a cdo and it's led to some incredible opportunities as you kind of hinted to or towards and you have a couple things so you have the the trucking meets train your train you will course, which train you, am I saying that right? Train you? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you have that, a new course with them. You also have a partnership with the Carolina Panthers. How did these partnerships come about and, and what do you hope to gain from them? So I think that for me, you know, I, I built my business on and, and on just just mutual partnerships really. Hey, Blythe, what are you doing? OK, well, I do this. So we, we should complement each other. And every every approach that I have is very strategic. I, I'm always consistently looking to improve the value that we provide for our clients through strategic partnerships, because you know what? You may be great at this, but you may not be great at that. Let's find somebody that's great at that with the end goal is to make sure that the customer, to make sure that the client gets the best experience possible. I am so passionate about our clients and I want every client that touches innovative logistics to get the experience that they will get nowhere else. And the experience that I'm looking for is success, right? I want my clients to come to us regardless of where they're at, what stage they're at and and, and get success. And so, you know, when we got, you know, when the, when the Panthers reached out to us and the other partners reached out to us, you know, the alignment and the vision was just, just to help small businesses become successful. My heart, is always small business focused. You know, I, I you know, I, when I go out to these little small business, you know, they might have like small business Saturdays. I'm that guy that walks the entire room and buys something from every single table. I don't care if they're selling this. I don't care if they're selling that. I'm buying it because I love small business. And, you know, when you support small business, you're supporting somebody that's trying to take care of their kids' college. If you're supporting somebody who's just trying to believe in themselves and trying to put you know, something out there that they had a deep passion and desire to do. So when I reached out and I focused and look at these partnerships, I appreciate partnerships that have small business at the top of their mind. I appreciate partnerships that are focusing on taking care of the small guy. This industry is dominated by small carriers. You know, if if Schneider, J.B. Hunt, Swift and all those um, larger entities Decided today, you know, what? we're not going to move any more freight today. We're taking the day off. You know who's going to come up and who's going to step up to the plate? ABC Trucking with two trucks down there in Ellery, South Carolina. Those are the companies that's going to stand up. And those are the companies that move our country forward. 
And I am so passionate about that. When I, I I'll never forget, I was in a truck stop and, uh, you know, early on in my career. And I, I just remember just seeing the faces of folks and just seeing just the, you know, they're on that. Back then, we didn't have, you know, the low boards on the app. We didn't have D18 truck stop and all that good stuff. We didn't have that. And they're standing on there at the washer and dryer and they're looking at the, the screen. It's a, you know, a, a, a television screen with a load and a broker number on there. And just seeing them just get on there and they're rushing to the telephone and trying to get through the first. And then just looking at their face, you know, hey, I was just trying to get home to, to, to spend the weekend with, with, with my son because he's got his final baseball game. And, and just seeing their faces, you know, dis- disappointment, discouragement, man, it just, it just, I just love people and I love to see people successful. And the things that come out of my mouth when I'm talking about this business, I'm not going to tell you everything that you want to hear. You're going to hear some things coming out of my, my mouth that you're not going to agree with. But one of the things that I'm going to always tell you is I'm always going to tell you the, the, the blunt and honest truth. And the thing is, is that I want people to be successful, but in order to do that, I can't want it more than the next person. So our partnerships were, were, were very, very strategic for us to be able to provide the level of service and provide the expertise and guidance and the technology that's necessary to help our small carriers operate like large carriers. And that's where that's where that came in. And so the, the, it's a course with Trainual that, that covers a lot of those things. And then I would imagine that the, it's kind of, kind of the same partnership with the Carolina Panthers. So with, the, with, with Trainual, we have so many different courses. We have a profitability expert course is for coaches like dispatchers or, you know, you got brokers that are looking to be able to add a different level of, of service to their clients. We have a startup course, which tells people from A to Z how to start a trucking company, all the way from branding, all the way from, you know, logoing the whole nine. It, it covers this like 77 uh, modules in that particular course. And it's not even, and I don't like calling it a course because everybody is coursed out. They're freaking out about courses because people are just trying to get, get rich off courses. And I get it, but it's a hybrid educational experience. And when I think about it, of course, is, you know, we tab our, our experiences, Innovative University, and it's like a college course you have to submit assignments you have to participate in discussion threads you have to watch videos you have to do research right so it's real Hmm. courses it's not a get rich course it's not one of those you know hey i'm just gonna you know put six modules in a course till you get started now everybody else still has questions afterwards so we have a very 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 broad range of different courses that we offer and with the and with the Panthers partnership it's really just that small business partner providing us with that platform to really partner with that to be able to have visibility uh and people to see hey you know what this is this is the trucking industry but since the trucking industry is 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 mainly primarily small folks these are the guys that you need to go see these are these are our guys right here these are who we're going to put our say hey you know what you guys are our guys. And I think that that's what we were looking for from that partnership. Very well said. And it's amazing to see, you know, your approach going from a, a worker who's in the trenches to educating those who are also in the trenches as well. So it really gives you that firsthand insight that, you know, for a lot of the course gurus that popped up and, you know, on TikTok in 2020, you know, a lot of them are probably, I, I mean, I don't want to guesstimate, you know, what they're going through right now, but this is that you, your education is an example of, you know, we're, no, we're going to take care. We're going to actually show you from experience, years of experience of what to do. And most importantly, what not to do in order to avoid these, a lot of these catastrophic mistakes. Um, so, okay. We, we've talked about the yellow situation. We talked about the new opportunities, um, that you guys are developing that are already here. Um, but what about some other, I guess, big industry issues? Is there anything else that you want to shine a light on? I think that compliance is another big industry issue. We're seeing a lot of folks, you know, really just try to fall under the radar when it comes down to that. Um, it's never been a small issue, but I think it's you see it more and more now. And, you know, when you think about fraud and freight fraud and combating freight fraud, you see a lot of brokers that are very, very gun shy when it comes to dealing with small carriers. And on the other side, on the flip side, we see small carriers not doing the foundational things that you should do as a business owner to ensure you establish your presence as a small business and you give them that comfort that, hey, you know what, I'm a new business owner, but you can trust me to give me a shot. I'm not going to double broker your freight. So I think that one of the biggest things that we've seen is a lot of small carriers are you know, getting told no, you know, more than ever. You know, you, you, they're getting told no because, hey, you don't have enough experience you don't have enough inspections yeah i don't trust you and we're seeing that that you know that 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 quite frequently now 
So the whole narrative and the whole mindset was, you know, we've got to make sure that we avoid the way stations and we scale, hopefully scale house closer. But, you know, when you're avoiding that, you're avoiding your opportunity to be out and be able to showcase that you are legitimate. And I think that that is becoming more and more an issue, especially for the small guys that focus so much on the spot market. And you see a lot of folks get stuck in places. You see a lot of folks that are not being able to uh, to even work with. I, I remember I was listening to my team explain to me with a new client who was just so frustrated. He was like six months in the business and he now he's just got his hands in the air. We were providing new services for him, um, try to help get him, move him along. But, you know, for every 10 calls that he's making, the brokers on freight, you know, he's getting told eight out of 10 times just because of not having enough inspections. So um, it's an issue. It's an issue because we're finding that a lot of 3PLs are limited in terms of their 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 outreach for mining their data correctly, um, and they're just given the you know the first right of refusal in their opinion is no, um, and and it's not giving the small carriers the opportunity, which I can understand. They're trying to protect themselves. They're trying to protect their freight, protect the customers' freight. Uh, but I think that we need to come to a meeting table and we need to be able to sit down with these folks and say, OK, well, if this is not it, then wh- what could we do? What could we what, what message can we get out to the small carriers that we can say, hey, do this, do this, do this. And then we'll, we can work together. But I feel like there's a wedge being driven. And mm-hmm. my messaging this year is really to start to, hey, you know what, I'm getting ready to pull this wedge out. And we're going to have to get to the bargaining table and sit down and really kind of talk about solutions instead of continuously focusing on a problem. What do you think of some of those solutions are? I think that just looking at tech, we're in 2023. Why are we sitting there saying, hey, why, why, why are we saying, hey, a, a, a inspection from a third party um, CBSA officer on a random Tuesday is going to say, aha, that's not a double broker. We have to use technology, right? We are in the era of chat GPT, BARD, things like artificial intelligence and like real artificial intelligence. But again, this industry, as antiquated it may be, we just started using ELDs over the last 10 years. So we are so far behind the tech that it is just insane. We have got to get ahead of things. We've got to we've got to be next step up. We're so reliant. And I mean, Blythe, we're still signing BOLs with hand with, with your hand. Like, what are we doing? I can ship a Rolex through 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 the you know through the mail and I have to you know have to sign for it. But these are the things that I'm 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 I'm, I'm struggling with us understanding. Mm-hmm. We've got the smartest and brightest people that we ever had in trucking, right? We've never had the brilliance in this area that we have because of the 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 ability to use the tools that we have to so the access to information. We have the most brilliant people in technology ever. But we're operating just like we operated 20 years ago. We might as well just shut the low boys down and put them over the washing machine and then stop. <laughs> We've, we're, we're struggling with adapting technology and we're throwing things at the wall, hoping it sticks. And I'm tired of seeing that. Let's sit down together and hear both sides. And when I was at the mats, I remember there was a listening session. And in a listening session, if you can hear the passion that was in the voices of those owner operators out there. But you know what was not present there? The FMCSA was there, but brokers weren't there. Hmm. I would love to be able to take that same approach and go to a, a broker conference and bring 50, 100 owner operators and let's sit in one room and let's talk about it then. And I challenge folks to make it happen. What about on the broker side of things? If they want to find those reliable carriers that, you know, they, that they also won't get, you know, I guess, fall victim to, to fraud or, you know, double brokering. Wh- what are some ways that they can find those really good carriers that just want a shot? Is, is there any hope for them right now? Or is it more like upper management that, that's, you know, bringing the, the rules? It's more upper management. You know, I, you got a lot of brokers that just, hey, this is what our compliance team says. You know, our compliance team says we're not going to deal with it. It's, it's just give you an example I'm here in Kansas City, um, you know, I, I've, I've got a couple of clients with large, you know, with large fleets. And one of them has a has a significant size fleet. And I met with him um, yesterday when when I landed and the nicest him and his team, the nicest group of people you will ever, ever come across face to face, met with them. They're hungry. They're, they want to make things happen. But then when you look on from a broker perspective and how they view that carrier, it's just it, it, I'm going to I'm not going to you know disclose on the, 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 the sources that um, that they're rated upon. But it's it's 
they, it, it, you can see that the wedge is there, that personality that they're saying, hey, you know what, there's an exception to the rule. Hey, let me escalate you to someone else on the team and let's give you another vetting, another part of the vetting process. You know, it's almost like they don't have the opportunity. Carriers don't have the opportunity to prove themselves like they did before. Hmm. How the heck am I as a carrier going to prove myself to you as a broker when you just use the system? OK, well, the system says that I'm this. OK, well, let me prove to you why you should be able to work with me. Let me give you what do you need? What do I need to do? Hmm. And a lot of times they don't have answers. They can't tell you. They're like, well, just get some inspections. Well, that's not. Let me tell you something. Get an inspection. Number one, that's not part of the FMCSA's requirements. You know, when I'm talking about the CVSA inspection. Right. But number two, it is 100 percent randomized. So you may, you may not. If I'm running a lane, and I remember for a long time between South Carolina and Georgia, there was tons of construction. And the two way, you know, the, the, there were several way stations that were along that construction line that were, were temporarily closed just as a, as a part of it. So if I'm running that for a couple of years, and I got two years of experience in it, in that particular lane, and I reach out to, to Blythe, and Blythe's like, yeah, I can't use you. You don't have enough inspections. You got to prove to me that you're, you're worthy. Well, Blythe, I've been running a dedicated lane between here and Georgia, and the scale house has been closed. How am I supposed to get a CFBSA inspection? Well, I don't know. Just tough deal with it. That's exactly the message that's out there right now. That is the message. We've got to get better at it. We've got to figure out a better solution. And that solution is we've got to provide them a platform to prove themselves. Give me a prove it platform. Show me a prove it platform. And then I'll say, you know what? I'll take that to the small carriers, and we're going to make sure that, hey, you know what? We're going to get the business formed the right way. Now we're going to make the prove it platform done the right way. Now, okay, now let's sit down and let's talk about it. It almost feels like there, with all the data that is in this industry, I, I, I don't know why that's not able to be verified that, you know, a certain MC number has run this lane for this many years. W is that just not available or are the brokers just not looking for it? There's technology for that. If you plug into an ELD API now from a carrier and that carrier has been running this, you know, motive ELDs for the last two years, you know exactly where that truck has been going over the last two years. Pull a log history, pull it if the data, you can get all that information. But they choose not to. Either they choose not to or they just don't have someone in their ear saying, hey, look, you say he's not valid. Here, let me show you the IFTA data. Let me see you give you his last four quarter IFTA bills to show you how hard he's been running over the last four, four quarters. Now, now tell me that. But we don't you know, that's that's where I say that there's there's more conversation that needs to be had. Is there almost maybe like a. a a digital resume for some of these carriers kind of, you know, take ownership of, of this issue and almost make like an online resume, maybe, you know, using their website or something like that, where they can list all of their, you know, partnerships or accomplishments, or, you know, here's literally like my ELD data, you can download it uh, right here. Is, is there anything that they can do to take sort of ownership in their own hands? Right now, the only thing you really can do, like you say, you spoke about creating that brand appearance, right? Mm -hmm. Getting that website up, making sure you don't have a Gmail address, make sure you have your own private domain. You spend money on a website, you spend money in your presence, you got social media information showing that you're legitimate, you know, and then getting the, getting that part out the way. But as far as digital tools, there's no new digital tools that are carrier friendly that's going to say, hey, you know what, if they come with this digital tool here, guys, they're not they're not a double broker. They have legitimate trucks. They are actually running trucks. And so I just see so many, I see technology not carrier friendly. Hmm. I see a lot of, and I don't want to say broker friendly because that's not fair to, to, to the brokers either, either, but I just don't see a lot of carrier facing data that says, hey, you know what, if Adam's trucking, because you know the crazy thing about this, check this out, Blythe, if I start a trucking company, if I chose to say, I'm going to start Blythe's trucking today, me, Adam, 23 years of experience in this industry, been driven more miles in reverse than some people have pulled forward have seen success at every level. If I start a trucking company today called Blythe's Trucking and I go out and get my MC number and I start an MC, you know I'm going to get told no, that I'm not, I need to, I need to get more experience. That's how the software and that's how their technology today is pointed. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it, is not, it, is, it is not mined to where it provides exceptions and there is no prove-it platform that's out there. It just feels like the, the the deck is stacked against carriers, and and mm -hmm. what can you do except for just take ownership of your own financials, take ownership of your own brand, especially in a digital atmosphere? And then it kind of sounds like you know get get out once you do those things, get out there and start networking and making those connections yourself. 
and just hope that they don't have, you know, sort of a compliance department that that's going to, you know, bring the hammer down on carriers that don't meet the necessary, you know, sort of book requirements for. Is that a safe assumption? That's a safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Switching gears a little bit to uh, the final part of the show, because I have a few rapid fire questions for you. <laughs> um, you kind of hinted at it earlier, you know, Twitter and threads. Do you have a, a favorite social media platform that you like to use to get your message out? You know, I, I like I like Twitter. I do. I like Twitter. Or X, um, whatever. Yeah, or X. Yeah, X. I, I like I'm it because it you know I I, I, I like that platform. Um, that's not where my primary following is at. You know, my primary following obviously is on Instagram, and um, I've got a pretty significant following on LinkedIn. But I love X because I'm able to connect with people from just so many different industries on a more relaxed level mm-hmm. versus like I'm on LinkedIn and I'm like this and I'm sitting like <laughs> right. this and I'm using proper words and I'm making sure I'm doing spell check and all that stuff. But on Twitter, I can just let it fly. Right. And it's no judgment zone. So I, I, I like, I like, I like Twitter X, whatever you call it, but I, I like that platform a lot. You know, it, it provides me the opportunity to do those things and, 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 and really get a really true, like full scope, uh, of, of my day. Like, uh, you know, I might comment on, you know, uh, a catch that, you know, that, 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 you know, that was thrown from, from Bryce Young, or I might be able to, you know, look at who, who the Hornets just signed and make a comment on LaMelo. And then at the same time, I'm talking freight. So I can, I can talk, I, I can, I can be free on that platform. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think uh, when Threads launched, I was like, I don't know if the Instagram community is ready for the kind of Twitter energy that's about to be brought here. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think yeah, they I think, were. I don't think they. I don't think they were ready for it. It's just such a, it's such a, you know, kind of like a, you know, squirrel type energy that you know that you get on Twitter. Twitter is absolutely is a, is a squirrel environment. One hundred percent. All right. What what platforms or digital media strategies should more freight companies be taking advantage of? LinkedIn, one hundred percent, one hundred percent LinkedIn. You find the the most most decision makers, the highest of the highs, the biggest voices, the biggest LinkedIn. Period. Like, if you really want to be heard, like like I said, you gotta sit up, you gotta button your shirt, you know, you gotta make sure you come correct. You know, but but you know, one hundred percent. I don't see enough owner operators on LinkedIn. I don't see enough. Um, I tell you, there's one you know that I follow, Dan. He, you know, I know you probably follow him as well, but. Like he, 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 he's, he got it. He, he's got it right. You know, he, I, I, him and Ingrid, I love following their, their content on LinkedIn because they're so, so just charismatic. They're so unique. They're so intentional and they just, and, and they do such a good job of, of getting out there. And you got so many people, you know, whether it be three PLs, whether it be, you know, I saw one time, I think one of them, it was a broker that was like, you know, made a comment on, on like Dan's post and he was like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do it because I've already got my dedicated customers. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy that so many others don't do the same thing. Hmm. I know it, it, with Dan in particular, I think he, uh, he, he's not a podcast listener. We, we've tried to get him to become a podcast <laughs> listener, but uh, he, he's not going to do it. So maybe we can convince him with, with this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, one of the, the next to last question, uh, favorite software tool you use every day that you can't live without? Slack. <laughs> Slack. <laughs> man, I swear to God, I can't live without Slack, man. And I, you know, shout out to Slack. <laughs> Slack. Shout out to Slack. What do you love about Slack? everything <laughs> the fact that like i can communicate with my team i can communicate with clients i can do video shots i can i can integrate everything with it my emails you depending on the title of the email it sends them it just makes everything one alert and one notification and it allows me to make things so much easier for myself but also like a, from a communication tool it allows me to communicate better it allows me to communicate and touch my clients it allows me to communicate touch with my team being able to provide direction and things like that man but like like 100 couldn't live without slack all right. And then finally, I can't let you go without talking a little bit of AI. How are you using, you know, you mentioned uh, ChatGPT earlier. I think I, you know, I've seen a couple tweets about you using Claude, which I, I really love. Um, how are you using different AI tools? So we're using it just, you know, just really now we're in a testing phase of mm-hmm. being able to use it to make the client experience better. We use it to help the, the efficiency and in, in operations and we're using it in bots. So we're allowing bots do um, do certain work for us that really kind of streamlines workflows, make things more efficient and let the decision makers focus on making decisions instead of focusing on tasks. So um, there are a couple of things, you know, I'm, I'm here at the uh, recruiting conference and 
Um, I'm not going to tell them, but I've got a presentation tomorrow that I'm going to surprise them on how to really put chat GPT in the old recruiting experience and be able to write better driver ads, being able to communicate better with, with, uh, with rec- potential driver recruits, being able to actually recruit drivers because it's like email marketing, right? You got to, you got to nurture them. You got to recruit them. And, and, and I'm going to show them on how to use automations and things like that on how to do so. That's awesome. Is, is there going to be anywhere where we can catch that presentation maybe after the fact? So I'm going to have my cell phone and a tripod posted up in the back of that room nice. and I'm going to definitely make sure I'm going to live stream it or either, either, either that I'm going to throw it on YouTube once I get done. Heck yeah. We'll, we'll be sure yeah. to link to it in the comments um, and, and in the show notes just to make sure that, that people are aware that they can watch oh, that kind of content. So um, I guess it, last question, um, anything that you feel was important to cover that we haven't talked about in this conversation? You know, when I think, you know, and I've said this, you know, in in my network before, I think that you do such a great job of organic conversations and I don't know how you do it. Being able to write, ask the right questions through the entire target. You're an amazing interviewer. And I'm not just saying that. I just want the public to really, 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 really see that. Um, you know, we could sit here and talk all day, right? Seriously. We can talk about, <laughs> I just looked you know, up can, and I was like, oh, an can, hour and 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can talk all day. And, and, you know, when I'm, you know, you, they say that, you know, when you love what you do, you know, it's not work or, you know, when you're having fun, time flies and it's, and it's like that in this conversation. I really, and I really want people to go back and, and listen to versus me saying, what did we miss? Why don't you go back and hit rewind on this? Mm-hmm. Go back and listen to some of those points, especially my own operators and small carriers that are looking to get off the load board and really secure a dedicated freight. Don't skip over that part. Go back, listen to that. Go back and listen to my brokers. Go back and listen to the part where we talked about. Let's get down to the table. Let's do a better job of vetting carriers. Let's come up with more strategies. Let's 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 take the gloves off for a second. Let's sit down and let's have conversations. Open our eyes, open our ears, and look at it from a different lens and perspective. I want you to go back and listen to the fact that I've got 23 years of experience in this industry. If I got 23 years of experience in this industry and I start a trucking company tomorrow, you're going to tell me, no, I can't haul your freight. There's a problem and you need to come up with a solution so that way we can do a better job together at it. 100%. So they can listen to this free education and then when they're ready to, to kick it up a notch, they can come over to Innovative Logistics Group and, and learn you know, even more of, of what they need to do to, to run not just a trucking company, but run it profitably. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Where, where can folks follow more of your work, follow you, all that good stuff? Follow me on LinkedIn at Adam L. Wingfield. You can follow me on Twitter at Adam L. Wingfield. You can follow my company on Instagram at Innovative Logistics Groups. You can follow me on Instagram at Adam L. Wingfield. You can follow my company on Facebook at Innovative Logistics Groups. And you can go to our website, which is www.innovativelogisticsgroup.io.